Hello, this is Brian Funk, and thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. I'm very excited to announce that my new book, The Five Minute Music Producer, is now available in paperback form, a real book that you can hold and touch and turn to any page you like in a second. And it's a pretty big book, 629 pages of activities, exercises, and wisdom I've learned over the years. It's available on Amazon.com. The Five Minute Music Producer is 365 music making activities that will help with your songwriting and music production. It'll help you fight writer's block, make more music, write better lyrics, develop solid workflows, learn techniques for generating ideas, and finish more music. It's like having your very own music production personal trainer giving you ideas and challenges each day. And the best part is the challenges are quick and easy and they only take a few minutes. So even if you don't have a lot of time, you can spend five minutes and advance your music production skills. There's no better time to improve your music than now. Imagine where you'll be after a year of these activities. The five minute music producer has hit the number one new release in the music songwriting and music recording and sound categories on Amazon. So check out the five minute music producer, 365 music making activities. It's available on amazon.com or you can go to brianfunk.com slash book. Hello and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. This is the show about all things making music. And today I have a very special guest. It's Matthew Dix. And to tell you a little bit about Mr. Dix here, he's a bet, this is going to take a while. He's a best, best-selling author of novels and nonfiction. He's also written a rock opera. He's a 56-time Moth, Moth Story Slam champion, nine-time Grand Slam champion. He blogs every day. I love his blog, and I get the newsletter. Um, runs companies, podcasts, teaches fifth grade. He has died twice, <laughs> and he's also <laughs> married and has two children. Um, and I think he's just a great thinker and educator. I've learned a ton uh, since I started reading your books, so... Um, Matthew, it's awesome to have you here. Thanks for being Thank here. Thank you. That was very generous of you. I appreciate it. Well, you've been very generous. Um, I was first turned on to your work by another podcast I had with Kepi Kutz, who is a songwriter living in Australia. And she told mm -hmm. me about Storyworthy. We oh, yeah. About songwriting and Storyworthy came up. So, um, you know... I love her work so much. I was just like, I'm going to read whatever she tells me to read. And th that, that book was one of those books that um, I listened to it and it was in your voice, which was fun. And as soon as it was over, I just started it again. It oh. was that kind of book. Like, I got to go back and hear this again. Oh, thank you. That's really kind. Yeah, I mean, um, the stories you tell in it are amazing. And then so much of the technique um, applies for me as a high school English teacher and also as a songwriter trying to make things interesting. And I think it applies to anybody that wants to have a conversation with another human being as well. There's so much in there. Um, I'm kind of curious, like, how did you learn all of this stuff? Because you have a lot of strategy, a lot of technique that you go through in the book. That's all practical stuff you can start applying right away. How did you figure this all out? You know, it's a really hard question. I used to tell people, oh, I just stumbled into something I was naturally good at, you know, later on in life. How lucky for me. And then my wife heard me say that one time. And she said, what are you talking about? You think you were just like born a storyteller? And I thought, I don't know. Where did I figure this stuff out? And, you know, she was kind enough to point out that first, I'm an elementary school teacher. So every single day I'm standing in front of the worst audience there ever is. <laughs> so I'm constantly trying to find ways to hook them, entertain them, do those kinds of things. You know, I've been a wedding DJ for the last 25 years. So I'm very accustomed to standing in front of large groups of people who don't want to hear from me either. And I have to sort of get them to do the things that I want them to do. I think it sort of started when I was a kid though. Uh, you know, I've always been interested in movies. When I was about 10, I saw E.T. And there's a scene in E.T. that so upset me, you know, fundamentally and on a story level that I wrote a letter to Steven Spielberg. And I said, mom, you need to mail this to Spielberg. And essentially it said, I love all your movies, sir, but you seem to have like one stupid scene in every movie. So if you just send me the movie first, I could tell you what the stupid scene is and we could remove it. You know, and for actually until a couple years ago, I was sort of annoyed that Spielberg didn't at least send me a letter back. And then it occurred to me, my mother never sent that letter. 
because it was 1981. Like there was no way she could find a way to land a letter in Steven Spielberg's lap. She took it, she smiled, she tossed it away and made me believe that it was sort of sent out into the world. So I think it started with that lens to storytelling, you know, and the desire for attention. I think that, you know, when I was in Brazil a couple of years ago, someone, a student, actually, a high school student asked me in front of an audience of like a thousand, you, you write books, you blog every day, you've got a podcast, you tell stories on stage. Why are you doing all this? Like, why are you constantly producing content for the world? And no one had ever asked me that question before. And I said to her, I said, you know, I think I'm trying to get the attention of a mother who never gave me enough attention and then died and a father who left when I was seven and never came back. Hmm. And then the whole room got quiet, including me. And I said, oh, I think we're having one of those moments that I talk about in my books and in storytelling, one of those like transformational moments where I suddenly see the world in a new way. I kind of think it started there, though. I kind of think hmm. it started with the idea that I wasn't getting a lot of attention as a kid. And I discovered that telling stories, particularly embarrassing, shameful, ridiculous stories from my life, the ones where I do stupid things, those are the things that people actually like perked up and paid attention to. And I think from there, I started figuring out what to do. And then when I became a teacher of it, I think it really helped that I was an elementary school teacher. I've learned to break down large complex processes into small repeatable parts. Hmm. So, you know, I take the same approach to storytelling as I do to long division, which is it's a bunch of steps. I'm going to teach you the steps and better than long division, you don't even have to use all of them. You know, in long division, you miss one, you get the wrong answer. In right. storytelling, you can take one of my strategies, never take another one for the rest of your life, and you will already be a better storyteller. So, mm -hmm. You know, that was the process that I went through to sort of deconstruct what I was doing inherently and naturally and the things I had learned over time that I hadn't sort of like solidified into a curriculum. And that's where it came from. It's a long answer to, um, a, to a question I don't think I actually answered completely, but I tried. No, I think you did. And, and you bring up the way life kind of works, how these things sort of make sense in retrospect when you look back and you see like, oh, those dots do connect. And yeah there's a thread that kind of got me here. Um, I've done s thought I've had like these like separate aspects of my life only to realize a little bit later, like, Oh, you know what? It makes sense now to me that this is where I wound up. There's no plan, but right. You can kind of see it looking back. Yeah. I wrote a book on creative productivity. And one of the things I tell people all the time is say yes to every opportunity, which I know is sort of counterintuitive to what most sort of thought leaders are saying today, you got to carve out space and learn to say no. And I think every time you say no, you close a door without even sort of peeking through it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when my friend asked me to be a wedding DJ in 1997, I didn't want to be a wedding DJ. I had no desire. I didn't care that much about music back then, to be honest with you. I had attended one wedding in my entire life. It was his. Mm -hmm. But I thought no one's ever going to ask me this question again. No one's going to offer me this opportunity. So I will say yes. I'll walk through the door. And if I find out on the other side that I don't like what I see, I'll go back and close the door. I had no idea that sort of being a wedding DJ would eventually teach me to stand in front of people and speak without nervousness or fear. It taught me how to use a microphone. You know, a lot of the, mm. a lot of the producers and theater people and sound people that I work with today, they always say, you're so good on the mic. And I said, well, I had to learn to cut through the voices of 200 half drunken wedding guests every Saturday night. And that's essentially how I learned to be good on a mic so that when I'm performing in a theater of 2000 people, I'm clear and competent and, you know, we don't have any sound issues. So you never know like what's going to build on what. So you just say yes to everything and, and hope that, that you find that thread along the way. Mm. You know, I thought about you and that story actually, because recently I got asked to DJ a wedding. <laughs> that was something I never did. And it was uh, kind of a favor to a friend. And it was sort of pitched to me as just playing a playlist, put it on shuffle. You know, you have the PA for your band and everything. So play some music. When I got to the venue, I quickly started to realize that the DJ is an integral part of the staff that gets the thing rolling and s from stage to stage. And yeah. I was so unprepared for that. And yeah, I always tell people that the music <laughs> is almost the last part of a DJ's job. Yeah. You know, it starts with sort of making sure everyone's where they need to be, making sure everyone has a chair, making sure the bride and groom know what's happening at every moment, because, you know, on your wedding day, essentially everything falls out of your head. And so you hire people to remind you what you wanted to have happen, because you often can't remember. 
And so my best DJ moments are the ones where I save something that sort of no one even realizes I saved. You know, I, mm. I find the bride in the parking lot who is hiding behind cars and smoking a cigarette because she's, hided, she's hid smoking from her husband. And she decided, <laughs> I'll quit on my wedding day. And then on her wedding day, she realized, oh my God, I can't quit. What do I do? So she's crying in a parking lot. So I sit down with her for 15 minutes. I calm her down. I make a plan on what she's going to do to tell her now husband, not tonight and not tomorrow, but you know, the next day that you smoke and you need some help. And I brought her back to the wedding and she had a good time. Like that's much more important than me playing twist and shout at the right moment or mixing a song in properly. And those are the things I do all the time at weddings that sort of go unnoticed, but I recognize are the most important things I do. And those are all the things that I wasn't aware I was going to be in for. (laughs) (laughs) Right, yes. And uh, I was a member of the staff, essentially. And I'm watching the staff change the tables, and it looks like synchronized swimming. It's like a beautiful work of art, how precise they were. And I felt like the idiot that didn't know his job. And (laughs) uh, it worked out well um, in the end, though internally it was a nightmare for me, just the stress of that and not wanting to ruin it for a friend. It's the most stressful thing I do. I am I am completely calm and <laughs> unconcerned standing in front of 2,000 people getting ready to perform for 45 minutes. But a wedding, when I know it's at that point probably the most important day of their lives and they're depending on me to make it perfect in every way, I don't get more nervous. That's really why I don't DJ very much anymore. I mean, part of it is sort of, you know, I either chose to keep up with the technology or say, this part of my life is probably over. Um, Mm -hmm. So I still do it occasionally for sort of like you did my sister's wedding, will you do my wedding, those kinds of situations. But a lot of it is, it's just a stressful day for me. And it's probably the most stressful days that I have is DJing weddings because so many other people are involved. There's a lot riding on it. (laughs) Yeah, there really is. Yeah. Yeah, my friend knew I was just kind of there to play music, but everyone else expects a professional. And that really occurred do. to me too. And I was like, oh yeah. no, they don't, I need like a sign that says like, just helping out. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> so I have a newfound respect for wedding DJs and, and all that goes into that. That's great. And like you said, it's a, not really a musical job. And that's- what No, I, I mean, you know, the music does not take long to master. It's not really hard and no one's really looking for the kind of mixes that you get in like a dance club. Yeah. You know, you can just sort of slide one song into another and, you know, the beat matching is lovely, but not necessary at a wedding. No one's really mm-hmm. looking for that sort of, you know, I've been dancing for 45 minutes to the same beat, even though there's nine different songs that have played. Nobody mm-hmm. wants that at a wedding. They kind of want to hear the whole twist and shout. They don't want to hear 12 seconds of it before you mix into the next song in a perfect way. So mm-hmm. the music is so unimportant. There was a time when in 97, when I started, when like you touted how many songs you had, we have a library of 45,000 songs <laughs> because when you went to the wedding, that's all you had. And if yeah. someone said, can you play? You either had it or you didn't, you know? And today though, you just have every single song that ever existed available at your fingertips at any time. So all of those issues have gone away completely. <laughs> yeah, I could see that's uh, a part of your life. I'm sure that, uh can leave off to the side as things keep changing. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious though, um, how do you find yourself being so comfortable in those situations? Um, so playing music in a band, for instance, I find the most uncomfortable parts are the parts in between the songs, the <laughs> stage banter, you know? And, and a lot of times I just decide not to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, standing in front of a group of high school students has become normal and well, uh, you know, sometimes it's definitely painful, um, usually when you're not getting anything back. But those in-between moments, I'm so amazed at um, stand-up comedians and, and a person like yourself that can just go up and talk. And that's enough for an entertaining experience. To me, that's, that's the scary part. So I'm curious for you um, if you have any thoughts about navigating that how did that become you know, I, comfortable or yeah I, I think a lot of it is sadly doing it you know i often meet people who sort of want the magic pill mm. please help me not be nervous you know and essentially you can watch a hundred people go off a high dive and every single one of them hits the water comes to the surface gets out of the pool they're totally fine you know and and you can you can sort of put yourself mentally through it 
But when you get up on the high dive and you're above the pool, even though you know every other person has been fine and you know you will be fine, the actual, you know, lifting off the diving board and falling into the water the first time is pretty terrifying. Mm. And I think that's the way it is sort of with what I do. Now, I have never been nervous on stage and I don't know why, honestly. I've, I always joke that it's sort of arrogance, narcissism, and stupidity that's sort of woven a blanket <laughs> of protection around me. I think probably more likely it's a combination of when I was young, I was already on stage. When I was at a Boy Scout camp, I was the person who would stand on the stage and tell every table what to go, you know, table two, it's time to go. And then eventually I was like, well, that's boring. Mm -hmm. So I'd make jokes about table two, you know, and then I'd, pretty soon it was like a routine where I was sort of on stage and people were paying attention to me. And again, I liked that. And then there's some perspective that comes into it. I think, you know, you mentioned I've died twice, you know, paramedics have restored my life twice. You know, I've been homeless and in jail and all of that sort of pales in comparison to walking out on a stage in front of 300 people. You know, <laughs> if they don't like me, I always know that the night ends and I get to go home. You know, I, right. I went to Smuckers a couple weeks ago, the company, the jelly company, I was consulting with them. And someone said, well, what are you going to do at Smuckers? And I said, well, I'm going to talk about storytelling and marketing and sales. And they said, well, what if what you have isn't good? What if they don't like you? You're going to be in front of eight, eight hours of like business people and trying to teach them something. What if they, they clearly don't like you? I said, well, I get to get on a plane and they give me a check, even if they don't like me. And then I fly mm -hmm. home and it doesn't matter anymore. And sort of that attitude of, I'm going to go on the stage. I'm going to do my best. I'm pretty good at what I do. It usually works out well. And if for some reason, all hell breaks loose and nobody enjoys the thing that I say, it always ends. <laughs> and then yeah, I just go ends. home <laughs> to people that I love. And it's the end of that. Like, I yeah. leave it in the past. And the next one is a couple of days later and that's fine. So that's sort of the attitude I have, which I know is not helpful. <laughs> Um, it, it is, you know, it does, I don't think it cures people, but I like to let people know everyone with the exception of very few people are nervous every time they go out. You know, I've worked with really famous people, you know, I've been in shows with famous people and I've been in the green room with them and they're very nervous and I'm the worst person to be around. Cause I just sit there and chat them up and they're like, could you stop talking? I'm trying to like run through my routine. I'm trying to mm. hold information in my head. And, uh, so the most experienced people on stage are often exceptionally nervous. And that can sometimes make people feel better because they often feel like they're unicorns. Like everyone is fine on stage except for me. No, actually, most people are pretty nervous, at least until they start talking, until they get their first laugh, or their first hmm. nod of approval or that warm feeling you get from an audience. Until you get that, for a lot of people, it's really hard. So for me, it just hasn't been as hard. I've been lucky. Well, it sounds like you have the experience and... And I think that is comforting to hear that it just does take time and yeah. just being in that situation over and over and, and noticing like, hey, I survived, I get to go home. Right. I, I get a lot of, um, you know, sometimes late night jitters before a day at school where I, maybe I don't have like lessons worked out the way I like them or things aren't going, it's not hitting where I want it to hit with the kids. And then I get into this whole thing like, oh, well, how did you even get here, you big phony? And you know, you just <laughs> oh, fooled enough syndrome. people. Sure, yeah. yeah. And it gets mm -hmm. bad, bad. But it's usually the kind of um reassurance of like, listen, you've been doing this a while now. Like, trust yourself. You've you've figured out bigger problems than this. And bottom line, it's over in 40 minutes. Yeah. Right. As bad yeah. as it gets. And it's mm -hmm. part of the beauty of that situation. And that's what I've told people when they say, How do you deal with like teenagers? I'm like, I only do it for 40 minutes and then it's, right. then it's a little break as bad as I it tell my, I'm constantly <laughs> telling my colleagues every day ends at 320 and there's only 180 of them every year. So like just get to 320 and then check off another day. And before you know it, the school year is over. I think sometimes though, we don't credit the progress we make and that makes it hard for us. You know, I, I know people who I've sort of started with, you know, people I've helped to get on stage the first time and I've seen how nervous they are. And then a couple of years later, they're still on the stage, you know, that I'm producing shows and they're in them and they're so much better, but they still don't credit the progress they've made. You know, I think you have to really be thoughtful about how was I in the past and how am I now? And the feeling of progress can often be very confidence building, you know, mm. as a performer, 
you probably know this too. Like everyone has a certain amount of bandwidth that they have to work with at any moment. And so a brand new storyteller, let's say, or a brand new stand up or a public speaker, when they go on stage, oftentimes a hundred percent of their bandwidth is simply focused on remembering what to say, monitoring what they're saying while they're saying it and not sort of panicking. You know, it's all content delivery, 100%. And then eventually over time, you don't have to use as much bandwidth. And so it starts to shrink and then you can do other things. You can start, you know, paying attention to the audience, noting who likes you, who doesn't. And then eventually get to the point where I am, where I can talk to myself while I'm talking to the audience. So I might say something and I see it land and I'll go, wow, they thought that was funny. And in my head, I'll say, now, where can I put that in again? How can I call that back while I'm still talking? Mm. And I remember I told an ER doc that once someone who was performing on our stage, a woman named Kristen, I said, you know, eventually you might get to the point where you can talk to yourself while you're talking. And she said, that is not possible. I do not believe you do that. And I said, all right, Kristen, but I kind of don't care what you think. And it is what I do. And two years later, she called me and she said, I was just speaking at a conference and I realized I was talking to myself while I was speaking. You were right. It actually can happen. And all it was for her was she went from 100% bandwidth to maybe 60% bandwidth, which meant she had 40% to play with and she was able to do those things that I can do. So I think we have to make sure we, we're always thinking about that first performance or that first time on stage or that first time you're teaching, the very first class you taught compared to the class you're teaching now. And if you credit yourself for the progress, that can be confidence building too. Mm. Yeah, that happens musically too, where you're just, I got to get the notes right. I got to make sure I'm remembering the words. Uh, but then you do kind of get a little bit of a muscle memory for that and start to play with it a little bit, play with the timing, play with uh, the delivery more. And it does. it just takes time though, you're right. Yeah. I love that point about celebrating the small wins. I think you mentioned that in um, some days today. Yes. The, this, that's your creative pro productivity book right. that I'm sure I've mentioned on this podcast before. Um, an important thing to just see when you're putting those little bricks together, because a lot of what you talk about is doing little things and, they, and how they add up. I just recently read a quote um, from... Well, it's from James Clear's newsletter. Yeah. Um, who wrote Atomic Habits, which yep. was one of the other books I read last year that it, that really struck me and was great. Uh, but he had Julia Cameron, who wrote The Artist's Way, which mm -hmm. I still need to read based on a few I have that on my shelf. I have not read it also. I, I just got the Audible version. <laughs> it was it was like a two for one. It was a good deal. But it's it was the myth of like the, I'll write that book when I have the time. And, and it could be, I could write that song, I'll paint that mural when I have the time. But she says, people forget books are written one sentence at a time. Right. Songs yes. are written pieces at a time, uh, little drops in the bucket over and over. And um, I, I really appreciated the way you break down some of the ways that you maximize those little moments to push the needle forward. And, you know, we, we all have the same 24 hours in a day, as, as did anyone that created and accomplished amazing things, whether it's like, you know, like your Steve Jobs, your Einsteins of the world, all had the same 24 hours, but a lot of it's how we manage that. Yeah, they probably had, if you're talking about <laughs> Einstein, even less, really, because we have so many things today that allow us to sort of not have to do work. Like right now, right now, my washing machine is washing my clothes, right? Mm -hmm. Shakespeare did not have that. Someone had to wash his clothes. Now, maybe it wasn't Shakespeare. Maybe it was someone else in his life who was washing his clothes. But there was a lot of stuff that people in the past had to do that we do not have to do anymore. And as a result, we probably even have more free time to us than those people in the past. And so I'm always reminding people, every great thing that was ever done is a thousand tiny steps. And oftentimes, it doesn't even matter what order you do the steps in. You know, oftentimes you can choose the steps that you're most invested in on a particular day. So screenwriters are really famous for this. They will, they'll plot out their movie. And when they sort of sit down to write, they write the scene they want to write rather than the next scene that needs to be written. And that's a great way to sort of keep yourself moving forward and being excited about what you're doing. But oftentimes you're right. People see, people see big things as sort of, I'm going to find a sabbatical. I'm going to do it when I retire. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to find a, a weekend where no one will bother me and I'm going to get some real progress done. Whereas I tend to think that 
there's a lot of time in every day that goes unused and the productive people are the ones who recognize that and use it. I've found this myself, summer vacation. I'm going to, I could do two albums, three albums mm -hmm. probably, and I can record more podcasts. I can, summer vacation going to be great. And we just had winter recess for a week, President's Day week. All these great plans. And I find when I have those big blocks of time, which is like what you dream for is like your artist self that can finally do the thing without interruption. I waste so much of that time. Whereas when I'm working and I'm coming home and I know I only have a few hours before I have to go to bed um, and do it all again, that's when I really cram in the time and maximize it. And there's some weird paradox going on in here where <laughs> the more time I have, the less time, the less I get done. And the less time I have, the more I seem to really just take advantage of that and get to it. Yeah, Mark Marin, you know, the podcaster and comedian, he talks about how the only way he can really write comedy is to put himself in front of other people on a stage and dare himself to fail, right? If he is given a weekend, he can't write a single line of comedy. It is only when he is forced to be funny in front of other, of other human beings that he can find the funny, you know? And I think mm -hmm. that is the way that a lot of people operate, which is to say, if you have a weekend with nothing to do, the pressure to create does not exist. Whereas, you know, if that song needs to be done tomorrow, suddenly the pressure to create is high and your production increases. I think the the way we need to sort of restructure our lives is such a way that we maximize those long periods of time as well and find ways to make them productive too. I don't think there's anything wrong with that pressure. I like, I kind of like that pressure too. My, I'm a stand-up. I do a little bit of stand-up and my sort of desire, which I can't do because it's a little too, um, it would just be too arrogant, but I want to get on stage and just say, give me any topic. <laughs> and I will try to be funny about it. Right. And I also, so I sort of uh, subscribe to the Marin, dare me to be funny and let me see if I can be funny. Now, mm. I also don't care what the audience thinks. So if I'm not funny, it doesn't affect me in any way. I just say, well, that didn't work. Give me another word, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I can't do that because it would be arrogant. But I do understand that the pressure increases productivity with a lot of people. Yeah. And you've got some clever ways to kind of zap some of those lingering minutes yes um, the thing i've repeated this to so many people um how you treat every minute equally yeah right do, do you mind explaining that for well anyone listening? yeah there's a there's a bunch of ways to think about it you know it's just so odd to me that someone will view the 10 minutes that they spend sort of waiting for their family to get ready to go right so i'm ready to go my son's searching for shoes as he always is. And my wife is finishing her hair and, you know, my daughter is nowhere to be seen. And I, I yell, we have 10 minutes to go. And then so often in those 10 minutes, while you're waiting, someone will just pick up their phone and start staring at it and doing the things that make us actually feel worse about ourselves than before we picked up the phone. And I just think that that 10 minutes is just as valuable as the 10 minutes at 4.30 AM when I get up to work on a book. You know, th those 10 minutes are just as valuable. And so every minute is precious and every minute can be used in a really positive and productive way. But we sort of just pretend that if they're not attached to other significant amounts of minutes, then they're not helpful at all. Actually, my production manager who read my book and sort of proofread it, she said that is the thing that changed in her life the most. She used to feel like I can't get anything done unless I have 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour. And she's a songwriter too, and, and does a lot of other sort of artistic things. And the book convinced her that, oh, I can actually get things done in six minutes. They don't need to be attached to another sort of 34 minutes to make a nice round 40, you know, just right. use the six minutes. But part of it too is having an understanding of what you could do in that time. Because I think the answer for most people is the phone mm -hmm. because they don't have sort of a list of, well, what can I get done in six minutes? And so I always encourage people, make a list of all the things that you can imagine doing in 10 minutes. So for me, that's everything from writing seven sentences in my next novel, rereading the last two paragraphs, starting tomorrow's blog post, emptying half the dishwasher so I don't have to empty the other half later, which will afford me more time to do what I want to do. It could literally be go wrestle with my son on the couch for six minutes because he's ready to go and we're waiting for the ladies 
and wrestling on the couch is joyous for me and doubly joyous for him. So if you have that list, then you always know, oh, I got three minutes. Here's what I need to do next in the next three minutes, as opposed to sort of stumbling around and looking for something to do. I found two pretty significant changes in myself after thinking about things that way. One is I think I can get into a task faster. You know, there's all the studies that say it takes you like 20 minutes to switch tasks. I think I'm a little faster now, but maybe more importantly, when I'm found, you know, with a few minutes, because maybe someone's running late or the meeting didn't start yet because we're waiting for everyone else that's just hanging out and whatever the situation, I'm like happy. I'm like, oh, good. I got a few minutes now. Instead of like, oh, they're wasting my time. It's mm -hmm. like, they're not wasting your time. You're wasting your time. Right. Yes. And what you describe as happy, I always think of as almost self-righteousness. Because I will <laughs> sit down in the meeting that has not started yet. And I'll watch everyone sort of staring at the clock and doing nothing. And, you know, my friend Steve, who works with me, he always says, I'm going to Matt Dix this meeting which is to say, there's no way I'm not coming to this meeting without other things to do, mm -hmm. right? He's noticed over time that you always have something, you know? And I said, absolutely. Why would I ever come to a place where people can control my time and I can't control it myself? So I always feel sort of tragically and maybe horribly self-righteous. And then I look around and go, well, I'm better than all of you because I'm crushing it right now and you're not. <laughs> and, and that's sort of how I feel all the time when I am sort of plowing through life and getting stuff done. And then I'm looking behind me at everyone who's sort of floundering. That feeling for me is very um, rewarding. Mm. That might make me more of a terrible person than you are. You're finding happiness <laughs> and I'm finding joy and sort of like the laziness and ineffectiveness of others. That makes me feel better. But both ways I think works just fine. I, I get that though. I feel sometimes like I'm running a race and like no one else realized we could have started already. <laughs> you know, I think that most people don't uh -huh. realize we're running a race. Yeah. That's the thing. I think we're always running a race. I talk to my students all the time. They're 10. I say, listen, many, many times in life, there's two or more people who want one thing and only one of you get it. It's a job. It's a whatever it is. You know, you're going to want to get something. There's only one of them and you're competing. And because you're my students, I want you to win every time. And sometimes that means being the best. And sometimes that means working the most. And sometimes that means giving someone a shove to the side so you can get to the thing you want, which is how life is. And I think that so often people don't know they're in a race. You know, they don't realize there's people like me who are actually seeking to outcompete them. They don't even realize they're in a competition. I often make the joke when I'm doing live workshops, I tell people how competitive I am. And then I say, I'm actually in competitions with all of you right now. You just don't know you're competing with me because you don't understand that everything is a competition. And it always gets a laugh. And it's it's not entirely true, but sometimes it is true. You know, it's it's as simple as in a workshop. If let's say there's 12 people in a workshop with me, I say, What's your name? And before they say their name, I always guess their name. And that is the competition I give to myself. Can I guess this person's name three times? in my life, I have guessed the person's name correctly. That is amazing as a human being for me. Actually, when I was a wedding DJ, every single wedding that I could at nine o'clock on a Saturday, I played Piano Man. It's nine o'clock on a Saturday. I landed those lines at nine o'clock. Once in my life, someone came up to me and went, hey, I see what you did there. I'll <laughs> never forget it. It's that is right. me sort of competing with the world, uh -huh. creating games and competitions, trying to get noticed, all of those things. I'm constantly doing them. And I think most people are sort of, they're not bothering. And I think it's a sad thing. I think there's a lot of room for your own amusement in those yes. moments. Yeah. Um, I, I litter those things throughout my day all day long at work. Um, you like any way I can find to even just amuse myself a little bit. <laughs> Most of the time it goes unnoticed, but it helps get you through the day a lot. Yeah. And, and then you can tell your, you know, I come home and tell my wife, hey, guess what I did today that no one noticed? Yeah. And, you know, I think most of the time she's pretending to be excited for me because if you're not there for it, it's sort of, right. it never bothered to happen. But I do believe in those things. When I was in sixth grade, Mr. Morin science class. I hated Mr. Morin. And so um, I took the dictionaries from the back, these dusty old dictionaries in the science room. And throughout the year, I replaced the word moron 
with a little definition that said, the teacher standing in front of you right now. And I sort of made it look perfect, which was really hard in like 1986 <laughs> to like type it and get it right. And, to, and one day one of my buddies saw me doing it. He's like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm replacing all of the morons in the dictionary with this guy. And he said, we never use the dictionaries. No one's ever going to see that. And I said, probably not, but it's making me feel good. And I like the thought that maybe someday, 10 years down the road, someone's going to open this dictionary, see it and laugh. And my buddy was like, you're not even going to see the laugh. And I said, that's all right. I'm sort of enjoying my life in this way because I'm trapped in this science class. I was sort of Matt Dixing the class at the time, which is to say I was making the use of the time that I understood when I was you know, <laughs> 12 or 13. And so mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think that those little amusements, they, um, I don't know, they get us through the day and I think they make our days a lot brighter. Yeah, I'm, I'm often snickering as I walk away from our sign-in sheet because <laughs> I've signed in as like Terminator 2 Judgment Day. <laughs> That's my name. <laughs> yeah. No one, no one knows. Just I, once I in a while. <laughs> I always mark position on my, um, I always have to write like Matthew Dixon and the position for some reason. For 24 years, I've written upright as my position. <laughs> no one said a word, which is a clue to me that no one cares about it either, that they've put a line on a form that no one needs to fill in because right. nobody cares what your position actually is. So it's also an indication of how much time we are sort of forced to waste with bureaucracy. And whenever you can cut it out or at least make it amusing for yourself, those two things are very good. I have permission slips that I need to sign for students once in a while. Next to it's like comment box. This long horizontal box. I just draw a picture that fits in that. So maybe it's an alligator <laughs> that stretches across it, or it's like Pac-Man chasing the ghosts. Right. No one has ever said anything. And, I, and I'm and i waiting. For, the kids always watch me. Like, Why are you doing that? I'm like, I just want to see if anyone will ever have a conversation with me about this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> These little things get us through the day. Yeah. What you said about um the kind of like competition thing, um, I was talking to my students yesterday uh, because TikTok is now rolling out an hour limit for people under the age of 18. So it's oh, going to lock. Really? They can put in a password and just get back in. You mm -hmm. know? I guess they define their own password, but it's meant, I guess, to trigger their mind like, hey, you've been on this for an hour. And we then went into our phones, looked at our screen time and saw the enormous amount of time people are spending on their phones. And I kind of worked it out that if you spend an hour a day doing anything, it's about two weeks a year when you add yeah. it up. Mm -hmm. So, all right, you were on your phone for eight hours today. So that's like getting on your phone, New Year's Day, 12 o'clock, right after the ball drops, and you're gonna be on your phone until May. Yeah. How do you feel about that? And some of them are, oh, I don't know. but. You know, trying to talk to them like there's a few things you can do. What if you could just reduce one of those hours into mm. something you want to do? Like some of you want to be professional athletes. You know, th their eight hours is playing the game. It's not on their phone. Right. If you, you can reduce that, and you know, somebody said like, oh, no one's going to do that. I was like, maybe not. But I want you to realize like you have an advantage over everyone else if you do. Right. If you can shave that off, you have this advantage. It's an opportunity for you. It's kind of like if ever, in the, the meeting, if everyone's going to just sit there and be angry that they're wasting their time, that's a chance for you to get that head start in that race. Right. I often say to kids, do you think Beyonce is spending five hours a day scrolling through TikTok? You know, do you think that's what she's doing? Because she's a content creator. She is making things that you are mindlessly consuming. Now, it's art and it's wonderful and I'm not sort of disparaging it anyway, but I always tell kids, you either are gonna be a creator or you're gonna be a consumer, or you're gonna land somewhere in the middle, which is what most people are and probably should be. But I think most of the kids who I know, most of them are just consumers. They're just sucking in, you know, whatever is being produced and they're not affording themselves the opportunity to create something. I think like an athlete sort of is creating something, they're creating a body that will allow them to perform, you know, or theater kids, they tend to be, less on their phone i've noticed because they tend to be in the theater creating things being you can't have a phone out while you're on stage rehearsing right. you know or my son he's on the tech crew he runs the sound and the lighting he doesn't have a phone anyway but if he did it's not the kind of thing you can take out while you're doing it so i always say if beyonce is not on her phone for five hours a day scrolling through TikTok, i mean do you want to be like like do you want to be like beyonce or do you want to just be like you you know and that kid that said no one's going to do it i would say well 
I'm pretty sure I can make an enormous list of people who are not doing on their phone what you are today. And most of those people, I can make an enormous list of hyper successful people who are doing extraordinary things all the time who are not doing what you're doing on your phone. So hmm. I think um, I think pointing those things out to kids can sometimes be helpful. I don't like the screen time on phones. The one thing that bothers me about it is when I look at my screen time, it's always really high, but it counts the times I'm playing music and podcasts, which I hate because I'm not looking at my phone. Like I'm washing dishes. I was just on the bike, you know, listening to music and it counted the hour and 10 minutes on the bike is screen time. I, I've written to Apple and said, can we please parse out the audio consumption from this, like the visual consumption? Because I do think the two are different. Mm -hmm. I can drive to New York and listen to a podcast for two and a half hours. And my phone thinks I was staring at my phone for two and a half hours. So we do have to watch that too, because I think not everyone is as terrible as we think they are, but most people are terrible with their phones. Mm. Yeah, I get that with like my timer app for when I'm exercising. It's like, oh, come on. That was right. That was yes. half hour exercise. <laughs> right. None of those things should count. They should yeah. really parse out like the stupid things we do on our phone, you know, <laughs> the, the wasteful, mindless nonsense, you know. I also love to remind kids that, you know, like this didn't exist like 12 years ago. 12 years ago, nobody was doing what you're doing. So you think it's impossible to imagine a world where you're not using TikTok or Instagram. But 12 years ago, none of us were using them. Mm. And we were actually funneling that into other things, you know, other pursuits and probably better pursuits than doing what people are doing these days. Mm. Yeah, because it's really like the thing. Everyone's pressed for time. Everyone's stressed. It's hard to make music because I don't have the time. I can't find it. Um, and you know, one thing your book does exceptionally well is point out areas where you can find that time, where you can make it back up. Yeah. Know, pick it back I, up that's otherwise lost. Get ahead of everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask you um, about, and this is a question actually from Kepi. She's, I told her I was going to speak with you. She's like, oh boy. You know, so she wanted to know, and I think it's a great question. Uh, do you have any favorite songwriters? And do you see storytelling aspects in the music or any even maybe the techniques that you teach that come through in some of the music and songwriters that you like? Yeah, I've, I've worked with songwriters before um, and rappers actually too. And that's been fascinating for me. I sort of didn't, I didn't see how I would be able to help them and it turns out I was able to. I tend to like the songs that tell stories more than anything. The, those are the ones that deeply appeal to me. I, I mean, I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't listen to The River. Um, you know, the story of this couple that sort of, they get pregnant early on in life, you know, when they're teenagers and they get married. And essentially it's a song about how that's it. Your life is over. We went down to the river. We went swimming. This is the best it's ever going to get. I listen to that song. And every time I listen to it, in my heart, I go, no, it's not over unless you let it be over it kills me that song it breaks my heart every time mm. and there's a weird part of me that hopes that someday i'll listen to it and it'll flip that something will change as a result mm. so all of those songs that springsteen writes that sort of talk about people and their lives and springsteen acknowledges that he's actually not any of those people which i think is a fascinating thing he's never worked in a factory in his life he's never been a, a union guy you know he's talked about how i'm not even really around those people very much but I used what I understood about them and my imagination and and wrote songs that spoke to them, which I think is great because it's, you know, people always say, write what you know, you know, tell that to a 10 year old who wants to write a science fiction epic, you know, mm -hmm. um, more challenging to write what you know. I think write what you can imagine is probably a better phrase. So I love mm -hmm. Springsteen. My daughter has been playing Taylor Swift around the house constantly. And I liked her. I was like, yes, her music is very catchy and I enjoy it, but I've just started really listening to it and it's pretty great. I kind of love the stories that she tells in that music. So she is a new person who I have sort of discovered is not just a, a catchy, I can really write a hook kind of musician, but mm. someone who is, I think genuinely writing things that are important to her. I, it comes across to me as if this is really relevant to her and it becomes relevant to me, even though, I am not sort of in the world of, mm -hmm. you know, a, a woman going through her life in the way that Taylor Swift is going through her life. So those are two that just pop into my head right away. But 
I certainly love the songs that um, tell stories. I have a Spotify playlist that is story songs. It's all the songs that I love that sort of tell stories about things. Those are my favorite mm. songs. Mm. You know, I bring up Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska a lot in these types of discussions because I love how he gets so specific about something. And like you said, people he doesn't even know, the situation he doesn't even have. But that specificity brings you to the universal. There's, uh, I think it's like used car off Nebraska. He's in the, you know, the he's dad's test drive in the car. The mother's nervously fiddling with a ring. Or sis, his sister's got the ice cream cone. And it's like you don't need to have a sister with an ice cream cone, or even be in a used car to like get this feeling of that that you know, like a family trying to pick themselves up, and and this right. is sort of like the best they can do. It's um, it's smart too in terms of storytelling because. People over describe all the time, mm. you know, in storytelling and writing. So often people tell me the eye color of someone in a story, even though the eye color will never be relevant in the story in any way. Mm. But what they're asking me to do is to keep track of the eye color. So mm. I meet this girl, she's got green eyes and freckles. And you're telling me that green eyes and freckles are going to be relevant to the story in some way. And when they don't end up being relevant, what you've done is just stolen a little of my bandwidth and keeping track mm. of green eyes and freckles, the whole story, and it doesn't pay off which can really be frustrating. What we want to do as storytellers, like Springsteen does is he puts a girl with an ice cream cone. He, the ice cream cone allows us to imagine the rest of the person. When he says the, the sister's holding an ice cream cone, you now see someone. Yeah. You see your vision of a sister holding an ice cream cone and you sort of fill in all the rest. You know, It's the idea that if you choose the right bit of specificity, just one word like used car, your version of a used car is clear in your mind. You know exactly what a used car in that song looks like just by the word used. It doesn't look like the one Springsteen's imagining, but he knows it doesn't matter. You know, unless, unless it's a pink Cadillac and you have to see that it's pink, he doesn't care what your version of a used car is. He wants you to lean into your imagination so you see it with great clarity rather than him trying to describe it with a million words that will force you to sort of architecture it in your brain in a way that's really challenging. So the idea in storytelling or in songwriting or in any kind of communication is you choose the descriptors that allow the person listening to throw all their imagination on top of it and see it with great clarity. So what you just described is the mother with the ring, right? Hmm. I know exactly what she looks like. And I know it's not what Springsteen or you think she looks like, but as long as I have clarity with it, that story comes alive to me in my mind's eye. Whereas if he had said, graying hair and blue eyes and a and a kitchen frock like now i'm like trying to yeah. put all that stuff together and i don't need to unless the graying hair is relevant to the story right it's the uh check off shotgun thing right where if there's a shotgun on the mantle in the first act it has to be fired by the third yes to yeah. eliminate yeah. that extraneous stuff right now the the ice cream cone, someone might say, is extraneous because it never plays a role in the story, in the song. But I'll say it caused you to fully envision that character. The singularity of the ice cream, ice cream cone allowed you to see everything about that character. Whereas if you told her her eye color, all you've given us is her eye color. You haven't spoken about her as a person in any way whatsoever because eye color doesn't say anything except eye color, unless it's Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, which in that story, eye color is exceptionally important. It is greatly critical that this black girl has blue eyes. That I get, but most of the time it's irrelevant. And it's actually, sadly, a vestige of first grade. Because first grade teachers, and actually most teachers, actually you're an English teacher, so most teachers of writing, especially in the younger grades, they view better writing as more writing. So a kid writes something, they bring it up to the teacher, and the teacher goes, this is great. Can you add some details? When in the history of the universe has anyone ever finished a novel and thought, God, I wish there were more details in that right. novel, right? It's never a thought we have. In fact, what we know is the fewer words you can use to tell your story, it's probably the best version of that story. But we learn as little kids that, oh, more writing equals better writing. And then the teacher says, go describe something. Tell me what her color her eyes are. Tell me what color her hair is. And that's literally what people do growing up. They describe hair color and eye color and height, all the things that are utterly irrelevant to a story. That's what's sort of like baked into us in younger grades 
and it just ascends as we get older. I have that exact problem. How many words does this need to be? I'm like, as few as possible. You yeah. know, like I always do you want to read as it more? Needs to be. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to read more than you need? Would you rather this paper we're going to read be 20 pages and say the same thing as it was in two? Yep. Yeah. Uh, life is short. <laughs> like spare us. Like right. The, my it, my wife teaches kindergarten, and one of her students just wrote a story, a kindergarten story. It said, "I love rainbows. Why don't boys love rainbows?" And I thought, brilliant. You know, <laughs> that is just fantastic. And in the hands of someone who's not my wife, who doesn't understand, they would say, "Can you go tell me all the colors of the rainbow and add that?" Right? Can you? <laughs> Can you describe the know. rainbow? Where was it? <laughs> what was the sky? You know? Yeah. And I'm like, those two sentences are all that needs to say. In that little girl's mind, in that five-year-old girl's mind, she's like, mm -hmm. I love rainbows. And yet all the boys around me don't seem to give a damn about rainbows. That doesn't make sense to me. That's what she's trying to say. And she said it brilliantly in two sentences. Any more detail would strip it of its innocence and its curiosity. Yeah, and its it, poignance and its, me yeah. and its memorability. You know, right. I will, I'll always remember it. Whereas mm -hmm. if it had the colors of the rainbow and- That you already know. <laughs> yeah, all those things. Yeah, I just was teaching a student. He came to me and he said, um, I can write action really well, but I can't do anything else. He's working on a novel with another kid. They're really serious about it. They're like 60,000 words in. And it's very violent, but legitimately good. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm sick of her write, writing all the other stuff and I do the di and I do the action. And I said, well, th let's do dialogue or description. Which one do you want to do? And he said, I'll do description. And I, I gave him a lesson on description and told him, you know, here's some things to think about. And he came back at the end of the class and he said, all right, here's what I wrote. And it was, the Catan was stained with blood as I rose it, as I, as I, as I lifted it above my head in the shimmering sun. And I was like, that's great. I said, what happened? He said, well, he stabbed him in the gut and I had him pull the Catan out and I had it stained with blood. That way I could say what color it was without saying the word red. And I said, that's great. Because I had taught him how to attach objects to other objects to enhance description rather mm -hmm. than just sort of applying a characteristic. And he said, and I didn't say red blood because that would be a stupid thing to do. And I went, yes, it would have been a stupid thing to do. So it doesn't take much to teach people. But I do think what you have to do is you have to be a writer. You know, I think most of the people who teach writing these days don't actually write with the exception of an email. And so we try to get kids to write fiction, but we don't actually write fiction in any way whatsoever. We try to get kids to write poetry, but we're not writing poetry. And so how could we ever understand the craft if we're not engaged in it in some way? Yeah, right. That's a, a definite problem. That's a great example too. And I wrote that down, attach objects to other objects, because uh, a lot of the writing I teach my students, and I teach this in songwriting too, just a lot of the lessons I teach in songwriting are, are just writing lessons, but right. I, I'll give them like a skill. It's a skill, I call it, not a literary device uh, mm -hmm. that authors use. This is something you can use, but attach other objects to, to an object to show characteristics. That's a great one because it it lets you do the, the fun work. That's what's fun about reading. That's what's fun about hearing a song and putting it together in your head. When it's all just made for you, and you know, where, what's your role? <laughs> what? Right, passive. <laughs> I get to picture like a, an innocent little girl who kind of doesn't understand the gravity of the situation through that ice cream cone. Right, yes. And if you would have told me all of that, then, you know, now when I listened to it, I didn't do anything. It was just the words. And, and Taylor Swift is a good example too, just to also give credit to that because um, she does a lot of that as well. And uh, there was one song I was looking at where she talked about how he left the scarf behind or maybe she left the scarf. I forget exactly how it was, but it was just such a great detail to show this, the way that people were connected and would have to meet again or not meet again, like you're going to give this thing up. And that kind of was so much better than just explaining it to us. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's... um. There, well, there's a lot of science behind uh, the idea that when an audience or a, a reader can put together things almost before the before they're told or before they're shown, that releases three chemicals in your brain that make you feel good. Mm. And as a storyteller, I know that if I can like get the audience to 
see the surprise just before I say it, or even be surprised, that also releases the chemicals. The release of those chemicals, the brain associates the good feeling with the person who offered the good feeling. So when you make someone laugh, for example, you become more attractive. That is a scientific certainty. Because when you make someone laugh, those chemicals are released in the brain. Your brain becomes a wash in these wonderful chemicals. And the brain says, and you're the one who made me feel good. Right. Right. And so suddenly you're slightly more attractive than you were a moment ago. And so the more we can do that as writers, as songwriters, as as storytellers, you know, the more we can sort of chemically alter the brains of our audience <laughs> in a positive way that makes them feel good the more they will then look at us as the makers of that good feeling and appreciate us more, mm-hmm. which is super manipulative and yet highly effective. <laughs> well, a lot of it is manipulation. You're, you are manipulating their lives. You're, you're getting them to forget about their life and believe in some other reality. I mean, that's a really powerful state. And I think a lot of us long for it a lot where we want to just escape and forget and we can get caught up in this, whether it's a song, whether it's a story, whether it's a film where you, your world is just no longer in existence and you're yeah. invested in something that you know has been created for you. Right. It's crazy. I, I'm, I'm exercising on the, on the bike and oftentimes I'm watching movies and listening to music. And I recently, recently started watching The Last of Us, oh, the HBO show based that, yeah. on the game. And I told my wife, I said, I don't know if I can get through this. Like, <laughs> I have a hard time watching things where adults have to keep children alive. Now that I've had kids, right, okay. it's just so hard for me to watch. There's a movie, The Quiet Place. Uh-huh. And I know it's great. And I haven't watched it yet because I know it's like adults trying to keep children alive in a terrible situation. I actually asked my students, I said, who's seen The Quiet Place? A few hands go up. I say, I just need to know that the kids are going to be okay at the end of the movie in order for me to watch it. And that's crazy because I know that's John Krasinski and Emily Blunt. They're actually married and totally fine, you know, and and the movie, The Last of Us. I know these actors are totally fine and none of this actually happened. And yet watching it is like tearing my soul out Mm. because I forget where I am and who I am. And suddenly I'm in their world and we want that most of the time. I don't want it when I'm riding a bike and I need to. You know, when I'm in, on my indoor bike and I need enthusiasm and excitement to push myself, I do not need to be terrified for the safety of a, of a little girl in a TV show. I need like John Wick to definitely be surviving at the end because I know there's John Wick 2 and there's John Wick 3 and there's going to be a 4. So I know Keanu Reeves is going to make it through this one. So I will watch this one. Those are the things I, I watch when I'm exercising. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> You need to know like you're getting somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, and that isn't to say that movies that rip my heart out and make me sad are bad. I just, um, it's, you need to be in the right place in the right time and for the right reasons to be watching those movies or reading those books or even hearing those stories. You know, I'm, when I perform on stage, you know, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be doing a show with a collection of my stories. I am very careful about what I choose. You know, I have a story about the death of my mother, which a lot of people really love, but I'm going to be at Canyon Ranch, which is sort of a retreat and yoga center. I don't think on a Friday night they're coming out to hear me tell the story of the death of my mother because we will all cry. And that's not going to be like what they're hoping for on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. So even in those cases, I will be very careful about the story I do tell because I know that they have a certain expectation you know, coming to a show on a per- particular night at a particular time. So, you know, I have to be careful in that way. Whereas the novels, I love a novel because you get to control how much you read and how often you read and whether you reread, you know, you're in control of that content. But when we're singing a song, when we're telling a story, when I'm doing stand up, I have to always be thinking about what does my audience want from me at this time, as opposed to what I might want to do, because those two things are often very different. Mm. Yeah, it applies musically very much as well. Um, one of the last bands I played in, you know, we realized we we're going to be playing at bars. People going out, the dive bar. So it's like, this is not the place for our deep, moody, artistic statement. Yes. You know, we made, uh-huh. fun, we decided to make fun songs that people could like kind of cut loose to, you know, and facilitate people getting together and dancing or whatever. It was so much better for the environment. That's, it's an important consideration. Where are you going to be? What are you bringing to people? Right, exactly. Yeah, as as performers, we just, 
you know the phrase, we take care of our audience. And that's really what it is, is I need to make sure that what you hear is okay for you. You know, I tell a story about one of the times I died was, you know, I went through a windshield, sort of died in the ambulance and got brought back to this life. This is going to suck. Yeah, this is going to suck. <laughs> and in the story, I describe the injuries that take place as I go through that windshield, but I don't describe all of them. I don't come close to describing all the things that happened to me in that car accident because I'm aware of the senses, the sensitivity of people, you know, highly empathetic people have a hard time hearing about that car accident. I watch them. I see how hard it is. Mm. And so I need to let them know how badly I was hurt for the purposes of the story, but they don't need to know the extent of the injuries. And so in that way, we're, you know, as performers, we're always thinking about what we have to say, what needs to be said and what can be left on the table to take care of our audience in a way they want to be taken care of. Mm. I'll often do songwriting based on what I'm imagining my audience doing. What are, what are they going to be? Is this like the drive home after the party and things didn't go well? Or is this like you're sitting at the pool in a summer day? Like what's the, the context? And some genres of music have that built in like dance, EDM music. Like you're at the club dancing, period. <laughs> like that's what it's right. for. <laughs> And what you're saying about um, that story, this is going to suck with the injuries, um, it's important to know you're injured, but the point of the story isn't the injury. And I, I, I think this brings us to a kind of a fundamental thing about your storytelling style. I, I use that for my classes, actually, that story. I showed it to them one of the performances you had and they have this like regents new york state regents essay they have to write where they identify the central idea of a story and then a literary device right very um the type of writing they'll never do again after they take the test right <laughs> you know? yes um and i play it for them and they're kind of at first like is this stand-up comedy like it's interesting but it's and it's funny sometimes but so they didn't quite get what it was at first but after you know, it's all said and done and they hear the story and the, the final outcome of it. I noticed like nobody asked, how was he after the accident? How long did it take him to get better? How did his injuries heal? Did his parents ever come to see? Like, none of those questions came up because that's not what the story is about. And right. I'm, yeah. When I tell that story, you know, live people cry all the time and I get a little emotional. I've told that story hundreds of times because it's a great workshop story. I use it in workshops all the time. And even at the end of that story, now I become emotional. But what I always point out is when I'm going through a windshield and dying in the back of an ambulance, no one cries. They just blink at me. You know, it's not until my friends show up later and become my family that people get all weepy. And I just say that's because no one can really relate to what it is like to go through a windshield. You know, there is no deep connection with someone who is experiencing something like that. But everyone understands what it's like to be forgotten or left behind or let down by someone they love. And then, you know, we all hope and maybe we've experienced moments where someone picks us up and, you know, in an unexpected moment, someone sort of sweeps in like my friends did that day for me and, and takes care of you. So that's not a story about the car accident. You know, the car accident is really just the vehicle, no pun intended, hmm. to get me into an emergency room where something really significant happened to me once. You know, that's really what I'm trying to, to get people to understand. So you need to understand why I'm in an emergency room. Understanding how badly I'm hurt, that is relevant to the story because if your parents don't show up for you at a moment when you were that badly harmed, that can, that strengthens the, the poignancy and the difficulty of that moment. Uh, but they don't need to know everything that happened to my body that day. And you're right. Nobody tends to ask me anything about it. You know, they don't even, you know, that happens on December 23rd. There's actually a story about what happens on Christmas and after Christmas that I have yet to tell. And no one sort of cares. No one's ever said like, what happened on Christmas? Because you were in the hospital, I guess, right? What was Christmas like for you? Like there's a whole interesting, I should tell it someday story about my Christmas in the hospital but no one's ever asked me. So I sort of have never felt the need to, to get to that part yet. It's interesting because um, you would think like that's, because that's the major life event, right? And this is something I think you really um, speak about really well and make clear to people is you don't need to have that near death experience to have a good story because the story um, almost shouldn't be about those things. 
you're, Correct. Really, yes, you're getting into the the moment of realization or change in, in a character. Right, yeah. That story and stories like it, I've had sort of an unusual life. You know, I've had a lot of those weird things happen to me. And you mentioned, by the way, you were in jail, and I wanted to just say for anyone listening, it was for crimes you did not commit, and you were exonerated. <laughs> I was I was actually put on trial and found not guilty. Yeah. Yes. What a story, I was too, jailed right? and tried and found not guilty, ultimately. Uh, <laughs> but all of those big things that have happened to me, those sort of memorable things, they can never be about the big thing because people don't understand the big thing. They don't. Few people understand what it's like to be arrested for a crime you did not commit. Few people have ever been on trial. You know, few people have been in jail. So those stories can't be about any of those things. They have to be about smaller moments. I work with um, I work with Olympic gold medalists and people who have summited Everest. And what they have come to understand, which I've taught them and what they figured out on their own, was you can't tell a story about getting to the top of Everest because no one understands what that is like. But you can tell a series of smaller stories about climbing up the mountain and make those moments relatable, you know, in a way that people can connect with. So one of my Everest climbers, he has this amazing story of there's a blizzard coming and he ends up in a tent on the side of Everest with a woman who he doesn't really know that well. They're, they're hunkering down for the blizzard and she sort of loses her mind and becomes really unsafe on the side of the mountain in the tent. And it becomes a story about like those situations in our lives when you are put on a work assignment with someone who is unreliable, or you're in a car and you realize the person should not be driving, hmm. you know, or you realize you're dating someone who is not a problem solver in any way and is only creating more problems for you. So it becomes relatable, even though he is in a blizzard on Everest, you end up thinking about, oh, this is like Janice at work, <laughs> right? She makes everything worse too. So when we make our stories, our big stories, super relatable about smaller things, people can connect with them. You know, ideally, though, I always tell people, you don't need those things. Very, very small things can happen to us that can have great meaning to us. And those are great stories, too. So mm -hmm. for every car accident, you know, near-death experience story that I have, I have 10 stories of, you know, famously, according to my storytelling friends, nothing happened and yet you somehow managed to tell a story that made everyone laugh and cry my friends in the storytelling world always say nothing needs to happen to matt for him to tell a story about it they're wrong what they're failing to see is something happened but so often in our lives the significant thing that happens to us it happens inside us so if you're actually watching me have a really meaningful moment you might not know that my whole life just transitioned in a new and fantastic way because it only happens in your brain. You know, you're not going through a windshield. You're not on the side of Everest. You're just like sitting on a bench watching, watching something happen and suddenly you understand the world is different than you understood it a moment ago. And you can tell that story in a really meaningful way even though someone watching you would never know something interesting was happening. Mm. And, and it's the key in songwriting. And really, in a lot of songs, it has a specific part called the chorus, you know, <laughs> where that's usually where the kind of punchline of the thing comes in or the message or the big question that's being raised. And a lot of times the verse is the details, the vehicles that get us there and bring us yeah. to those moments. Right. That's a good point. Choruses tend not to be laden with mm. details. They tend to... They get more general. They get yeah. more universal, thematic. Yeah. That's interesting. I, that had never occurred to me, but you're right. The density of the songs are in the verses, not in the choruses. Yeah. Hmm. You, you, you um, have a, a pretty cool TED talk that just came out about um, your best audience. Oh, and, yeah. And you, you talk a lot about how telling your stories um, has helped you deal with them in your life, almost a lot like therapy in a way, I think, like talk therapy and I, I found the same thing too sometimes I find myself telling these stories to my students of like horrible times being bullied as a kid or <laughs> like embarrassing moments that I probably wouldn't tell in more social situations but for some reason there's a little bit of a distance you know they don't know these people I'm talking about mm -hmm. and, but it is kind of validating to um say it to it like a young person that that gets it you know even if they didn't have that same thing they know that feeling and and it humanizes you to them as well and i think it 
as you've kind of said too, it sort of humanizes yourself to yourself. Yeah. And, and I think that's what a lot of songwriters get too. After you write a song, there's this like cathartic feeling of like, oh my God, I like emptied this thing and it's amounted to something. And it, as much as it defines your past, it doesn't control it. Yeah, I am. Um, I, you know, I say the best audience or the most important audience for every story you tell is yourself. And yeah, every time I sort of decide to tackle a story about something that was, let's say, more challenging in my life, my homelessness, for example, you know, when I was homeless, I was basically homeless because the people who should have helped me didn't. Hmm. And so um, I ended up, you know, without a home for it was six weeks, which is not a terribly long period of time. But I didn't think it would be six weeks. I thought it was forever. And, and six weeks was rough. So um, for a long time, before I told that story, it felt like a virus in my life, like an infection. It was always there. It was always the idea that I was homeless because people didn't want to help me. And that felt terrible. And then when I finally decided to tell the story one day, and I sort of crafted it up, lots of remarkable things happen. The first thing is you make it a chapter in your life. So you sort of you know, you, you carve out space for it and you, you know, you stop the infection from spreading into other parts <laughs> of your life, which is great. Make chapters out of your life. And then because I'm crafting it, I have to really explore the moment. So I go back into that time. And I recognize that even though there were people who definitely should have helped me and didn't, there were people who should not have helped me, but did. And by framing the story around those people and de-emphasizing the people who could have helped me, but didn't, it made me feel a lot better about that time. It, it mm. recognized that there were people who were really remarkable and did amazing things for me. And they were not the people I expected and probably not the people who should have, but there were fantastic people in my life. And that allowed me to lean into them instead of into the, the loss you know, mm. that I was suffering. And then, like you said, you make it into something. And then if you share it with yourself, just by saying it out loud, I think that's all you have to do. But then I take it to a stage and I tell it in New York. And every time I tell that story, someone comes up to me and says, I lived in my car for 18 months and I was ashamed to tell anyone. I never wanted anyone to know. And, and now I think I might tell some people, you know, and the second I started telling that story to my students and the second year I told that student, the sto that story, I had a girl come up to me and say that over the course of the summer, she had been living in the car with her mother and they were now in an apartment but she had been spending the year worrying that if they had to move back into the car, she wouldn't be able to come to school anymore because she thought she needed an address to be able to go to school. So just sharing that story, alleviating her of that worry, and then sort of taking care of that family a little bit by putting them on the radar and making sure we knew that they were going to be okay, that just brought enormous value to what was once a really hard thing for me to think about. And now is something I have no problem with and kind of enjoy sharing because I always know wherever I am when I tell that story, someone's eventually going to come up to me and say, yeah, I was couch surfing for two years and I don't talk about it, but you know, now I feel better about it and maybe now I will talk about it. So yeah, I think um, telling those stories is important. If, if you only tell it to yourself, even that is enough. I think that's like I said, most important audience to every story or every song, I think that you write and perform. Yeah. I think you have to say it out loud. You know, we always sound good in our heads. When we say it out loud, our brains get to hear it too, not just our minds. You know, it actually goes into our ears and it processes in a way that doesn't get processed if we're just thinking it. So saying it out loud to yourself, I think changes the way you can think about it. Mm. I've had that experience with songs and, and songs have the liberty to be a little more abstract at times too, poetic and you can, yeah purposely just let people connect mm -hmm. the dots. And I find that I wind up doing that myself for the things I've written. And sometimes I look back and I'm like, oh damn, like, hmm, look at that. And things that might've been embarrassing or uncomfortable get sort of reshapened. And they talk about memories, you know, how, first of all, how unreliable our memories are, but every time we remember something, we kind of retell the story and it sounds like a really good way to take something that it could be something I suppose like victimization or something or helplessness or, or or embarrassment or shame whatever it is that we we all have tons of those things to kind of 
it gives you a chance to reframe it. Like you said, you focused on the people that helped you. And then yeah. it's like, hey, there, there are good people out there. And sometimes they're not the people you're related to, or they're not the people you're friends with, or there's, they're just strangers. Um, that's, that's a very helpful message to take away into life from here on out after that chapter's done. What a great lesson to have learned from that experience. And it almost makes that worthwhile having that experience. That it, yes, it was a valuable of. experience in yeah. that sense. It's it's making value of it. You know, yeah. I always say like, I was taken off the streets by a family of Jehovah Witnesses. And, you know, I shared a room off their kitchen with a goat for 18 months. I lived with a goat in a pantry. And my friends always say like, it's such a great story. You're so lucky. And I'm like, I would have taken it away. I did not need to live with a goat for 18 months to have a good story. I've got enough good stories. But if you're going to have a moment like that, to turn it into value, I think is really enormously powerful. I think that's, you know, that's what we do in storytelling. And that's what we do when we, like you said, we reframe, you know, we re, you know, we, we, we look at what's happened to us and we, we decide on the way that we want to feel about it and the way we want to tell it and the way we want to sort of lock it in, you know, which is what I've done with the homeless story. And many of the other stories is I've locked them in, in the way that I want that narrative to feel in my life. And that makes me a happier person, I think. Mm. Yeah, you turn it into like a reason to move forward rather than an, an excuse not to. Right, it also strips the shame. I, so mm -hmm. much of our lives, we place more weight on our shame <laughs> than anyone else would, you know? There's, um, there was a time when I was the stripper for a bachelorette party in the break room of a McDonald's restaurant when I was like 19 or 20. And my wife was the only person I had ever told that story to. I still have the thong that I wore that night that was provided to me by the woman organizing the party. And I told my wife that story and I said, I'm, that's the one I'm never gonna tell. I'll tell everything else, but not that one. And then some moth Grand Slam championship came up in New York and the theme was exposed. And my wife said, well, you're going to tell the stripping story, right? And I said, I'm never telling that story. Like, that is that is the ultimate shame. I just can't believe I made that terrible decision and went through with it. And she eventually wore me down. And I told that story. And I remember stepping up onto the stage so angry at her. As I was going up there, I was thinking like, my God, I can't believe I'm going to do this. Quickly, like going through my Rolodex, do I have another story I could just start telling instead? And it took like 12 seconds for me to be in the middle of that story when I realized, why have I attached so much shame to like a hilarious, ridiculous thing I did when I was 19 years old? And by the end of the story, everyone was laughing. And it's actually about something too. It's not just a funny story. It's about the idea that I thought I was chosen because I was good looking. And they were like, wow, I really want to see what you look like without clothes on. And it turns out they had basically asked every other guy in the restaurant and they had all said no. And eventually they made it to me. And so it ends up being a story about like wanting to be the good looking one in the room for once and thinking you were, and then discovering you're not. And lots of people, they make that wonderful sound at the end of a story like that. They go, mm, which is really them going, I understand exactly how you feel. And I feel the same way. And now we're connected. That's what they're really saying with just the simple hum. Mm. But having people enjoy that story, and it is now my most requested story, the story that I used to think contained <laughs> the most it? amount of shame that people would feel the worst about me after hearing ends up being the most popular story. So I think oftentimes we have to look at the things that we're embarrassed about and ashamed about and say to ourselves, should I really feel that way? And what I often tell people is the two stories that don't ever work. If you've ever harmed an animal, you should not tell that story. It's just never going to work for you. Mm -hmm. Although I do tell a story about going to a war with a cat in a really careful way, but I, there's no harm really done to the cat, but I do go to war with a cat. But don't tell stories about harming animals. And men should never tell stories about hitting women. If you've ever made that terrible mistake, nobody wants to hear about it. Other than those two topics, I have yet to find a topic that contains so much shame that you can't speak to it. And I've heard stories about sort of like real difficult childhood horrors that have happened to people. And if you processed it and you're able to craft it into a story and tell it in a way that an audience can receive it in a way that they can hear you and not sort of feel like they're in the therapist's chair. 
you can tell those stories, but um, I just think we assign so much shame to things that don't deserve shame. And once we, once we find the courage or we have a wife who's, you know, wearing us down like erosion, once you get the courage to say it out loud, you quickly discover, oh, this is nothing. And people kind of love it. And so I'm always excited when I do something stupid or shameful or embarrassing because it means I have a new story to tell. Isn't that funny how that works, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, all the what? time. I'll walk in and go, honey, I was a terrible person at the grocery store today. I'm going to have a great story. And she says, could you just peel the potatoes? I know you're a terrible person sometimes. You can tell me after you peel the potatoes. It's a great way to frame the issues in your life is these will be good stories for my friends. <laughs> this, There's a phrase in storytelling. A... We say, you had a good time or you had a good story. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, it's ironic because these are the things that we think are unmentionable. People will never forgive us. They'll never forget. they will always be the guy that did that thing. And yet they become some of the more endearing things that make you a human. They Yeah. You and, kind of always want to be the guy. Like the tragedy is everyone's forgotten. No yeah. one remembers anything. You know, every single human being alive in 1802 is now dead. And almost every single one of them is utterly forgotten, even by their own family. Mm -hmm. Like you don't know who in your family was alive in 1802, unless you won a battle or invented some cure to a disease or, you know, had your name slapped on a bridge, you're forgotten. Mm -hmm. And so you should be thrilled when someone says, you're always going to be the guy who <laughs> stripped in the crew room of a McDonald's restaurant for a bachelorette party, right? You want to be that person. I just, I think people so often would prefer to be not noticed because to be noticed is so frightening in so many ways. Mm -hmm. But if you're not noticed, um, you will be quickly forgotten in this world. And I think people deserve to be remembered. Mm. It's true. I mean, it happens in our own lives. Even we, most of our life isn't even a memory, you know, right. it gets forgotten so much. And, um, you have a great, this might be a nice like kind of thing to round us out, um, as a teacher to deliver a little homework, but you have a great strategy that I've only practiced a little bit, but, um, I see the value in very much and I know I should do it more often, but the way you come up with stories, you have a very specific method of collecting data and information and remembering your life really. Yes, right. It really is that. Even if you don't plan on writing a song or telling a story, you know, I call it homework for life. It was it was created out of desperation. I was running out of stories to tell. And I didn't want to be the person who told the same story every time. I, I hate those people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I gave myself this homework assignment, which is every day at the end of the day. This is how it began, at least. Every day at the end of the day, I'm going to think of the one moment from this day, even if it's even if it's a nondescript day, an average, you know, no nothing day, I'm going to pick the moment that means the most to me, the, the most story worthy moment, the thing that happened that has never happened before or rarely happens, all of those kinds of things. And I'm going to write it down, but I don't write the whole thing down because that's crazy. I, I like small, repeatable things like brushing your teeth, you know, those, those things you can do in five to 10 minutes. And so I created a spreadsheet just on the left column, it's the date and on the right column, you know, I stretch that B column across the screen and that's where I write my moment from the day. And my goal was to get one new story per month, 12 new stories per year. And instead I discovered that my life is filled with stories and, and not just me, tens of thousands of people all over the world are doing homework for life now, including many, many, many of my former students who I introduce it to when they're 10 years old. And now I have students who are 25 years old who write back to me and say, I can't believe I have at least one memory from every single day of my seventh grade year. Like we don't even remember our seventh grade year at all. And I, all of my students, or at least the ones that are smart enough to continue on with it, they're holding on to their days. And what happens over time, the miraculous thing is you just develop a lens for storytelling. You start to see that like lots of things happen to us that are worth holding on to that we throw away. The tragedy of our lives is we just, we throw away days like they're meaningless. And then we say this really stupid thing, which is time flies and it does not. Time does not fly. Just ask someone in prison if time flies. Ask mm -hmm. someone sitting in a trench in Ukraine right now if time flies. It doesn't. The problem is, is we throw time away. We live a day and we make no effort to hold on to anything from that day. We just toss it in the trash like it was meaningless and move on. 
to the next day. And so what we mean by time flying really means we don't feel time because we're doing nothing to hold on to it. And so a week disappears because we didn't do anything to capture something from each one of those days. Homework for Life says, capture something. Someone said something to you, you saw something, even you thought something. If you think something new, that can be a moment in your homework for life. And you know, if you read my book, there's a section of homework for life. You can actually see a part of mine from 2015. And I did some math recently. In 2015, I was noticing 1.3 items per day. That's how many items I average per day. Today, I average 7.3 items per day, which means I'm writing down 7.3 moments every day where something happens that I don't want to let it go. That's not because my life is more interesting today than it was in 2015. It's just because that lens has become sharper and clearer and I see more things. And not everything becomes a story. About 10% of the things in my homework for life ultimately land on a stage, either as a story or a little part of a story. Another about 30 to 40%, I actually tell to my wife, my kids, my friends. So only about half of the things that I ever write down get spoken out loud. So half of it, no one ever knows about it except for me, but I'm holding on to my days. So even if I'm not a storyteller, even if I'm not a songwriter, I'm slowing time down. I'm being more observant and watchful and thoughtful about my life. And I'm acknowledging that every single day has value and it should be held on to. Something from the day should be written down to mark your existence on that day. And as a result, I, I don't have a problem with stories anymore. My my list of untold, uncrafted ideas for stories that I've never even gotten to, like Christmas Day after my car accident, that list is over 700 items long now. So I'm a person who is now going to run out of time before he gets to all the stories he wants to tell, which is a great problem to have, as opposed to what most people have is, oh, I've got four or five good stories, which is just the dumbest thing to say. You have a multitude of stories. And you just allow those days to slip through your fingers like they're nothing. Mm. Wow, seven times the uh, output every day is pretty amazing. It's not really, because honestly, it's just someone says something to you and you're like, wow, that's great. I'm going to write that down. Or It's you know, seven you have times a thought. that you noticed something special in your life, though. What does that do for your overall happiness, even oh, as a person? Oh, it increases it exponentially. <laughs> I, yeah. My wife says, I am the only happy elementary school teacher on the planet right now. <laughs> my, I had a colleague yesterday. She walked by me in the hallway. She said, how are you doing, Matt? And I said, great. And she goes, you're always great. Every day you're great. Do you ever have a bad day? And I thought, well, not like yours. I, I don't think, you know, um, I am a very optimistic, happy person. And I see my life as filled with great stuff, you know, and, and maybe you won't have 7.3. I I interact with 19 other human beings, you know, as a teacher, seven hours a day. So that's going to increase the number of moments I might have with people. And I have a family, but a lot of my moments are, yesterday I went to the post office and I had a package and a man had an envelope and we were walking in. He was ahead of me. He, he opened the door for me and I said, thank you. And I went ahead of him. And then he was actually coming into the post office to get in line. I thought he was just dropping an envelope off. And so he was behind me now because he had let me go. And so I said, oh, go ahead. You were here first. And he goes, no, it's fine. You get to go first. And I thought to myself, I never would have done that. Hmm. Time is too valuable to me. I would place time over kindness. And he did not. It's in my homework for life, which is a moment we would utterly forget three hmm. days later, right? But for me, I think I'm going to tell a story about it. I think I'm going to tell a story about how remarkably kind you can seem with a tiny act of generosity. And that's just the kind of moment that would be utterly and completely lost to me had I not taken a moment to go, that man, I'm going to get that man and he's going to be in my homework for life. Sometimes it's just a thought. I was driving down um, Francis Avenue, which is the road right over here, just a couple months ago. And I looked up at the sky and it was blue. It's like the bluest blue. And the thought I had was, I'm so glad the sky is blue because I know on some planets, like the sky is orange. And like brown even, you know, yeah. and we get blue. Like that's lucky that we get to look at blue every day and not brown or orange, you know? And then I realized it took me 50 years to look up and be grateful to the blue sky. So that was just a thought that filtered through my mind that entered my homework for life. And 
I'll never really speak about it on a stage. I never thought I'd speak about it at all, except for this moment here. But when I read it back someday, I'll remember exactly where I was. I'll remember the moment. I'll remember the feeling I had in that moment. And that's what makes our lives feel richer and more complete and more full by acknowledging those little moments that we just toss away like they're nothing. Hmm. It turns your lens into looking for the memorable, good things, the, the noticeable things. I do a little exercise with my students and I'll say like, anyone see th anything red in this room? And they'll point to the red things. Anyone see anything green? And, that's, and I'm like, you notice how it pops out when you look for it? Yeah. You know, like you will find what you're looking for. And if you're looking to be angry and complain, and it sucks we had to get up so early today, didn't it? Yeah, it sucks it's <laughs> raining today. <laughs> like we could, we could do this all day long if we want. It'll continue to pop out for us. But as soon as you decide to change it and look for something else, well, then you'll see something. That was cool. My friend gave me a high five in the hallway. Nice. Right. Glad I have a friend that will do that. And everything pops out. And it's a very similar thing I do in a sampling class I teach where we're looking for sounds and you're surrounded by sounds at all time and, and you can turn that into music. It can be a, a little percussion sound you use in your song or you can pitch it in, into a playable keyboard and now it's this interesting sound that nobody else has. It's yours, it's yeah. unique in a world that's so hard to be unique and different in because you can stand out in these ways and. I love it, and I think you may have pushed me over the edge to really dive in a little harder. Because uh, I mean, like that that post office moment is just that's great. I mean, it is so simple, and it took nothing <laughs> from really anybody. Right. Yeah, but it it's just a great thing to to happen, <laughs> you know. Right. <laughs> so many people are stepping on each other, honking their horns, and <laughs> to, to just have like he held the door for you. He had every right to go ahead of you. <laughs> right, yeah. Every, more than one opportunity too, it's really mm -hmm. cool. And he highlighted my awfulness. <laughs> he didn't know it, <laughs> but I sat there going, well, here's an example where I'm terrible and I'm gonna go home and tell my wife, I'm a terrible person. And she's gonna say, just peel the potatoes. <laughs> but someday that'll be on a stage and it's it's simple. It, those are the examples of the stories where my friends say nothing happened to Matt and somehow it became a five minute story that made people cry at the end, you know, and laugh in the middle. And um, that's all it is. It's That'll be a story someday that I will take to a stage and will mean something to people, even though it feels like nothing to most people. It, it's a great way to tune your mind into the things you're looking for. You know, yeah. it, makes, it makes no day ordinary. And right. it, it's a great technique for songwriting too when, when you listen for lyrics, right? And you, now you're watching a TV show and the commercial comes on and it's just a cool phrase happens. And you're like, ah, there's a title for a song. Right. I grab text messages now. I um, I'm, I do stand up, and I'm just getting started again. I stopped during COVID, and now I sort of have a buddy who's going to do it with me. This woman, and I texted another one of my friends, and I said, "Hey, you've wanted to do stand up before. We're going to start doing it. Do you want to go to the open mic?" And he said, "I'll think about it." And I texted back and said, "Just say yes." And he texted back and said, "You live saying yes. I live saying meh." And I just took that text message and that's in my homework for life. I kind of want to remember that David told me his life, he lives it as meh, um, which is a tragedy, I think, you know, a yeah. terrible thing for him to say, <laughs> kind of hilarious too. Yeah. And just one of those moments I don't want to forget. So even you can grab someone texts you something amusing or profound or interesting or mm -hmm. amazing. Yesterday, my son and I were wrestling on the couch again. He wanted to wrestle after school. And the way he told me he wanted to wrestle was I heard him from the living room. He said, I'm just a boy on a couch, defenseless, waiting to be murdered. That's mm. what he said, which was his way of saying, come wrestle on the couch with me. Before I wrestled on the couch, I quickly wrote down in my homework for life exactly what he said. Mm. And then I went and kicked his butt on the couch because I never want to forget that moment. I'm just a boy on a couch, totally defenseless, ready to be murdered. You know, most parents will just forget everything their kids say. Mm. And so I'm holding on to everything that they say. Yeah, and I mean, there may be a day where he doesn't ask you to do that anymore. That exactly. might have been the last day he decides he wants to wrestle dad. Right, you yes. Know, there's yep. uh, the Absolutely. last time we do things all the time and we don't usually know. Right, yeah.
So I hold on to them. And and someday when I tell a story of him and I want to make him sound silly, I might grab that sentence yeah. and use it in the story, right? As an example of how silly he is. So that might actually make it on a stage someday, but if it doesn't, I'm going to have it forever. So that's yeah, great too. As a memory. Yeah. Yeah. Recently, uh, my grandmother turned 90 and we were gathering pictures of her for the kind of like a slideshow. My mother and I were going through boxes and boxes of photo albums. And the way a photo triggers a memory that you just never had before. Yeah. Um, but it's, and, and that's why they're so valuable, right? I mean, and if the physical thing, the, the old times, that's when we were at the Grand Canyon, I was 10 years old and kind of forgot about that day, but it comes, you know, tumbling right back. back, especially yeah. when you have another person to kind of <clears throat> go over it. Bounce off, yeah. Um, to give yourself another medium like that, like, writing it down, homework for life. Um, and for me, my music, when I record, I have so often capture noises that just happen in the background. And um, a lot of times it's wrong. Like you don't want that in your recording. Uh -huh. And I've, I've left those in. My cat, I saw your cat earlier, stop yeah. uh -huh. um, My cat was kind of jingling between my legs while I was recording a quiet classical guitar part. And his right. little collar made his, with the bell or whatever, made the noise. And I was like, oh man, you know, listening back. But I was like, nah, I'll keep it, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. now, 15 plus years later, he, you know, he, sadly he's gone. Mm -hmm. um, but when I hear that song, I'm back. I know the exact room I was in, where I was sitting. And I remember yeah. Theo coming in there, like, yeah. like they do when you're trying to do something. Right. There's just, such a great moment to have and to 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 hold on to that stuff is so important because it, it just fades away otherwise because there's a lot of other songs on that particular album that i recorded a lot of parts on i have no idea what i was doing mm -hmm. but those right. moments stick out yeah and most people don't hold on to them so you can have that great self-righteous feeling of i'm holding on to my life while other people are letting it slip away too and, yeah there you, you know, go i have a student right now who's doing homework for life very religiously and she finds a lot during the day and she came up to me and she said i'm doing it and a lot of people aren't and i'm happier for it and i went that's right you're better than everybody else now go back to your seat and get your math done <laughs> yeah. you do this like um on a computer is that how you keep it i do I, well i have my computer with me most of the time so the spreadsheet is always open you know i could open it right now but when i'm not around my computer i just i pop it in my phone if something happens to me and then at the end of the day, I transfer everything from the phone into the computer. And then I sit there for five minutes and think, what else did I forget? Like, what, what do I want to add that I might have not captured over the course of the day, but now I can reflect back upon and say, oh, yeah, that was a moment too. Hmm. So between the two, I mean, it takes, it's less than 10 minutes to, to hold on to your life forever. So if you don't do it, you're just a rotten person. <laughs> <laughs> you wasted this gift. Yes. Uh, it's it's kind of helpful hearing you talk about that process. I think when I have recorded these things, I, I have to pick like the best, the moment. And right. and that you do seven a day, it's like, okay, well, if I have three, I'll do three. I, yeah. I don't know why it that was a block for me, but. Mm -hmm. um, well, I used to look for stories. I used to be like, I got to find a thing I could tell a story about. I can't really tell a story about Charlie saying, I'm just a boy on a couch, right? That's mm -hmm. not a story, but it's a moment I want to hold on to. And remember, half of the things that I write never get spoken to anyone. They're just for me. And only 10% of them actually make it into a crafted story on a stage. Mm. So a lot of the stuff I'm writing, I'm not judging. I'm just saying this is the day that I live today and I'm going to hold on to it. And then what comes of it is wonderful or not at all, but either way, that's fine. Mm. Yeah, it's really cool. Really great activity for so many reasons can't think of a negative whatsoever. No, there isn't. If you're a hermit and you're never speaking to anyone, you should still be doing homework for life. Hmm. Yeah. I agree. That's excellent stuff. Um, I know you mentioned um, something about a course. Oh, right. So, yeah. Uh, well, I have my book, Story Worthy, and then um, I have some partners now that were sort of putting together video courses. People would come to Hartford, like from China to work with me. And I thought this is crazy. So, um, so people who want to work with me on the, you know, want to work with me, but don't want to come to Hartford and can't attend a workshop. 
we're putting together video courses. So right now there's one on business and we have one coming up for storytellers. And we actually have one centered just on finding stories, all of the strategies I have for finding stories for people who don't want to take a stage, but want to hold on to their life or maybe share things with their friends at dinner and stuff like that. So if you just go to StoryworthyMD, my initial storyworthymd.com, you can find all that stuff there. And there's lots of free resources too for people to use. And um, if you join my Facebook group, which is story worthy for business and professionals. I actually teach free workshops there as well on Facebook live. So every couple of weeks I do a one hour workshop for people to come in and learn a new skill with storytelling. So if you, you can find all of that at storyworthymd.com okay. or even at matthewdix.com. That's my website where my blog is and things like that too. Yeah. It's matthewdix.com is, is great. I, I love it. I subscribe to the newsletter. Look, I hate getting emails and uh, <laughs> I find myself on so many email lists, but yours is one of like three maybe that I get that I thank you every day. I read it. Um, th and there's always something of value and uh, it, it seems like you follow that thread of like that moment, that seed of a thought. Um, so many of them stick out. I, I love the one you wrote about, uh, the distrust of responsible humans <laughs> about just the little things that erodes the trust. And it's like, unfortunately I run into that once in a while. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, there's no, um, you know, I've often had people tell me, you know, your blog would be more successful if you sort of stuck to a topic. And I said, that's really not the point of it. The point of it is I wake up in the morning and I have a thought, you know, I, and truthfully, I have 188 half written blog posts right now sort of like, here's an idea, here's a thought that might become an idea someday. But sometimes I wake up and just go, oh, here's a new idea I have. It's sort of my warm up for my day. It's the way I write to get started. So, um, I, and it's doing fine. It has lots and lots of followers who seem to be interested in what I have to say, but it isn't focused. One day I might be writing about something that happened to me in a Dunkin' Donuts. And the next day I might be attacking a political figure who's really annoyed the hell out of me. So there is, you know, <laughs> I, I swing wild in many directions. I like that about it, actually. Um, some of the stuff that I get that for email or blogs that I do like, um, I don't always read because I um, I don't really need to read about that today. But right. it's always kind of like, what's he going to talk about today? Yes. <laughs> what's going on today? <laughs> and just practically, um, you put that together first thing in the morning? Is that kind of just, a, is there a routine? Because, I mean, you must have to do it every day. I actually see this one is posted 5.34 a.m. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the morning. Uh, you know, I, I'm usually up before five and after I feed the cats and empty the dishwasher, I, uh, I'm i writing. And some of them are sort of like, you know, like I said, there's a whole bunch that are half written or almost written. A lot of times I write a blog post and I don't know how to end it. So I'm like, all right, I wrote about this thing today, but I don't have the punchy wrap up. So I'm like, all right, we'll push it aside. And someday the punchy wrap up will come. Sometimes I just read something. I read something about gold recently. This amazing fact about gold that all the gold that has ever been mined in the history of the world can fit in like three Olympic swimming pools. That's how much gold we've taken out of, out of the planet, which right. sounds like both a lot and very little at the same time to me. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I don't know what I'm going to do with that, but that's an amazing fact. And so I just put it in a blog post as a draft. Someday I'm going to find something to say about gold and its rarity in the world and how weird that is. And it just sits there. It might sit there for 10 years before one day, suddenly I'm buying a gold necklace for my daughter for her 16th birthday. And I'll be like, oh, I wrote about gold. And now I can relate the two and suddenly I have a post. So I'm just constantly collecting ideas. And some of them, I know instantly what I'm going to say. And some of them are just here's a thing. Maybe someday it will be something else for me. Maybe I'll say something different about it. So yeah. Collecting them every day is a great idea. I mean, musically too, a lot of things get left unfinished, but to have that routine and then there's a purpose for it too. There's a delivery you're doing. Um, yes. There's day. an audience that helps. I know that thousands of people are reading it every day. So that you know, that's that pressure that you put on yourself mm -hmm. that I got to get it out before nine o'clock or it won't be in the, or the newsletter will not have a, you know, it'll be a newsletter the next day with two posts instead of one, you mm -hmm. know, and I can, by the way, just change the time of that newsletter if I wanted, but I don't because, <laughs> you know, it needs to get out by nine. So, yeah. yeah. That's a great strategy. And, and again, it's uh, just a great 
great post every day. It's something always interesting. Thank you. Thanks. I, I'm seriously, I am really a, a big fan of yours, and I love what you're doing, and I think it has improved my life on a lot of levels. And I'm really glad. Thank you. And I, I'm not the only person that I know that feels the same way. Um, so I would, you know, again recommend, as I've done before on the show, story worthy, excellent, um, and it applies to life really. But um, and that's something I love when when this art, music stuff connects with life. Yeah. Um, but the songwriting, especially, and the productivity stuff in some days today is uh, invaluable in so many Thank levels. You. Thanks. I thank you so much for your time and and sharing your wisdom with us. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much. All right. And thank you for listening. Have a great day. Hey, if you enjoyed the Music Production Podcast, please consider giving it a review on your favorite podcast provider and share it with a friend, somebody that you think might enjoy the show and get something out of it. That would mean a lot to me. And if you want to check out more of my work, including sound packs, tutorials, etc., head over to brianfunk.com. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day.